today we start a series in the book of Judges based on Samson. And let me tell you where I'm going with this, and I'm going to read the scripture to you in just a moment. But um, I, I really feel strongly. Back this fall when I was praying about this year and what God was saying, and I just felt strongly in my heart, the Lord saying, teach my people to be strong. They're going to need the strength of the Lord in uh, the days ahead. Paul said, uh, brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. How do we be strong in the Lord? When I was led to this study of Samson and, and uh, got really excited about some things that have been back in my head for a long time about Samson's life. And, and that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about finding a strength that always wins. A real strength. Strength of mind. A strength of heart. A strength of purpose. A, a strength of finding our destiny. We're going to see all of those things as we get into it. But I want you to know this part too. Just about every sermon and every book that I've ever read or heard on Samson falls into a moralizing tone. In other words, Samson did this, don't do that, you're going to get the mess he did. And it just becomes a don't do this and do that type stuff. And there's, there's no doubt we learn vice and learn against, uh, against vice and for virtue and scriptures and examples and people have made bad decisions and we don't want to make those. That, that's there. But there's something so much greater than that. Let me tell you something. If you take the Holy Spirit out of the next three chapters, all you got is a, you know, a, a, a Philistine killing, lying, murdering womanizer. But you put the Holy Spirit in it, and there's something else there. And let me tell you what, I look at it, and like so many have looked at it, and write books on everything, and come up with all these do's and don'ts, and yet, what does God say? Oh, Hebrews chapter 11. When God says, these are the men and women who had faith in me. Samson's right in the middle of it. God's final word is, he's one of the heroes of the faith. Despite all that went on in his life. That gives some of us some encouragement in our life. And it really teaches us to look at what God says and not what we say as well. And then real quickly, I'll say this as well. They, these are, they're, they're secrets. Can I use that word? They're secrets to be revealed in these passages. I'm going to talk about one today secrets, keys. There's something beyond the story that when the revelation of the Holy Spirit comes to us, we start seeing some things that unlock something for our life. Today, I mean, we're going to talk about the, the secret of strength. We're going, what really is strength? Strength was not in his hair. Thank goodness, you know, it wasn't in his hair. We'll find out where the strength really was. So what's the secret of that? We're going to talk about the secret to, to, to a, a lot of things that are there. I'm going to talk about the secret to worship. Uh, here today and how to overcome in our lives. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read Judges 13 to you real quick and, and move through this as fast as I can today. Verse uh, 1 of chapter 13. Again, there's my text and that's my word right there. Again today. Again, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines for 40 years. Now there was a certain man from Zorah of the family of the Danites whose name was Manoah and his wife was barren and had no children. And the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Indeed, now you are barren and have borne no children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. Now, therefore, please be careful not to drink wine or similar drink and not to eat anything unclean. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come upon his head. For the child shall be called a Nazarite to God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. A Nazarite. I, I preached a whole message on that. Uh, the Nazarite vow, you know, a vow to not abstain from wine or strong drink, uh, the fruit of the, of the earth, uh, to, to not see a dead person, no, no razor come to head. What, what did we learn about that? Those, those had spiritual connections, and, and I love the wine because the Bible speaks of the wine as the greatest thing the earth can offer to bring happiness and joy. But when someone took a Nazarite vow, they said, I found something better than the best thing the earth has to offer. And so this man was not going to just be a Nazarite for a vow in his life. His whole life was going to be a Nazarite. Verse 6, so the woman came and told her husband and said, A man of God came to me. His countenance was like the countenance of the angel of God. Very awesome. What? Who else do you know that's very awesome? But I did not ask him where he was from, and he did not tell me his name. He said to me, Behold, you shall conceive and bear a son, drink no wine or similar drink, nor eat anything unclean, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. Then Manoah prayed to the Lord and said, Oh, Lord, please let the man of God who you sent 
Come to us again and teach us what we shall do for the child who will be born. By the way, there's faith there, isn't it? Lord, hope this comes true. No. When this happens, we want to know what we're supposed to do. Verse 9. And God listened to the voice of Manoah, and the angel of God came to the woman again as she was sitting in the field. But Manoah, her husband, was not with her. The woman ran in haste, told her husband, and said to him, Look, the man who came to me the other day has just now appeared to me. Manoah rose and followed his wife. When he came to the man, he said to him, Are you the man who spoke to this woman? And he said, I am. Who else do you know said, I am? Manoah said, Now let your words come to pass. What will be the boy's rule of life and his work? So the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, Of all that I said to the woman, let her be careful. She may not eat anything that comes from the vine, nor may she drink wine or similar drink, nor eat anything unclean. All that I commanded her, let her observe. Then Manoah said to the angel, Lord, please let us detain you, and we will prepare a young goat for you. The angel of the Lord said to Manoah, Though you detain me, I will not eat your food, but if you offer a burnt offering, you must offer it to the Lord. For Manoah, Manoah did not know he was the angel of the Lord. And Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, What is your name that when your words come to pass we may honor you? And the angel of the Lord said to him, Why do you ask my name, seeing it is wonderful? Unto us a child is born, a son is given, and he shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Wonderful. Who else do you know named Wonderful? Verse 19, Manoah took the young goat with a grain offer and offered it upon the rock of the Lord, and he did a wondrous thing while Manoah and his wife looked on. It happened as the flame went upward towards heaven from the altar that the angel of the Lord ascended in the flame of the altar. When Manoah and his wife saw this, they fell on their faces to the ground. The angel of the Lord appeared no more to Manoah and his wife. Then Manoah knew that he was the angel of the Lord. And Manoah said to his wife, We shall surely die because we have seen God. But his wife said to him, If the Lord had desired to kill us, he would not have accepted a burnt offering and a grain offering from our hands, nor would he have shown us all these things, nor would he have told us such things as these at this time. So the woman bore a son and called his name Samson, and the child grew in the Lord, blessed him. And the Spirit of the Lord began to move upon him at Maniah, Dan, between Zorah and Eshbel. Listen, the verse is verse 1 today. Again, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines for 40 years. I want to talk about Christ and the birth of Samson today. I want to talk about how to break free from a cycle of defeat in your life. Pray with me this morning. Father, thank you for your word. I pray, God, you'd open it up to us in these moments that we have together. And I pray, Lord, it'd be strong and powerful to us that we might learn that secret to breakthrough and escaping, Lord, the endless cycle of defeat and negativity that we get caught up in so many times. Father, I pray this and ask it today in Jesus' name, amen. The time of Judges brings us to a very interesting time in the history of God's people. You have the people of God who went to Egypt when Joseph, the brother that had been sold into slavery, was brought there. And then he was able to bring his brethren down there. And they were blessed because of what he had to offer them. And they grew and multiplied. But the Bible says there arose a Pharaoh over Egypt that did not know Joseph. And this Pharaoh enslaved these people and made them slaves for his building projects. And so for 430 years, that's a long time, God's people kept multiplying as the slaves of Pharaoh in Egypt. And then God, in the wonderful stories of Exodus, brought about a deliverer by the name of Moses. And after he was 80 years old and saw a burning bush in the backside of the desert, he went and said to Pharaoh, let my people go. For I have a land for them. They went out in power and authority of God's grace and miracles and, and, and could not believe God fully. You know, they, as the saying goes, you know, God uh, got them out of Egypt, but it took God a little bit more time to get Egypt out of the people. And so they spent a whole generation wandering in the wilderness. And finally God raises up Joshua. And Joshua organizes the people and they come into the land to take possession of the land and drive out those that do not belong there. And many great stories in the book of Joshua of them doing that. But they made two very fatal mistakes at that time. And those mistakes are very clear in the book of Judges. The first thing they did is they did not drive out the enemy as God had told them to do. And this led to the sin of idolatry to them. 
It says it in Judges chapter 1. They forsook the Lord God their fathers. They did not utterly drive them out. And because of that, they were tempted by the gods of the people that were still in the land. The other thing they did that was a fatal thing at this time is they did not teach their children about God and the great acts of deliverance that he had done. Listen to this verse, Judges 2.10. And also all that generation were gathered unto their fathers, and there arose another generation after them which knew not the Lord, nor the works which he had done for Israel. You know, if you'd have told me when I first started out in the ministry 30 plus years ago that there would be congressmen and senators that would interview future judges in our land and say, are you qualified because you're a Christian and is that going to interfere with you being a judge? I can't vote for you because you're a Christian. I'd have said that'll never happen in my lifetime. But generations come and generations arise when they know not the Lord and things change right before our eyes. Well, God did something during this time period of judges. It's about 300 years of Israel's history. And, and they were in this endless cycle during this time of, of defeat. They, they would disobey. It's just real simple how you could just do the circle. And it sounds real familiar. You know, they disobey God. And they would turn from God and they'd turn to idols and they'd do what they want to do. So in the, as a result of that, God would allow the enemies to come and oppress them six different times. The Midianites, uh, you know, the Canaanites, uh, the Philistines and different groups would oppress Israel. And they would get under that oppression and under that persecution and oppression, they would repent and they'd cry out to God and God would send them a deliverer, a judge as they're called in this book. And he would deliver them and they would worship and bless God. And then they would fall into disobedience and sin again. And then they would fall under oppression from a new enemy. And then they would come up and repent. And it just six different cycles we find in this book. And Samson becomes the last one that we have there. That cycle of defeat sounds a little too familiar for too many people today who find themselves, it seems like, am I ever going to break out of this? Am I ever going to move into the fullness and freedom of what I know God brought me into this world for? Am I ever going to get there? I believe there's a secret in this passage today and some other passages that we will draw from and look at today. The cycle starts in this life. Again, verse 1 says, again the children of Israel did evil and the Philistines were allowed to oppress them for 40 years in their life. What's the key to escaping this cycle in your life of defeat and really embracing and moving into it? What's the, what's the secret? What's the answer that is there for us? It's very, very simple. The answer is having an encounter with the living God. Walking in a relationship with Him where we're experiencing the presence of God. In our lives. You say, well, how's that a key? I want to show you from the scriptures about that. Can, can I just say this? Having an encounter with Jesus Christ is absolutely essential for you to be saved, for you to start this whole thing. You know, I don't know how many times I run into people and talk to folks that are in church, and I'll say, Are, are you a Christian? Yeah, I'm a Christian. Why? Well, tell me about it. Tell me your story. Well, I, I prayed this prayer. You know, praying a prayer don't save you, folks. Well, you know, I, I got to feeling funny, and I walked down, and I signed a card one Sunday, and, and the preacher and everybody hugged me, and, and I got baptized. Getting baptized don't save you, folks. Signing a card don't save you. You know, people get to trusting in some really strange things right under our noses in evangelical churches. You know, there, there's only one thing that saves you, and that is a relationship with Jesus Christ, the living Lord God, having an encounter with Him. And you say, well, do you expect Him to do something like He did in the Bible? When it, yes. Yes, He does. I was in an outdoor ball stadium in a crusade setting, and James Robinson was preaching the the gospel, Bernard Jackson was playing his saxophone, and I'm sitting up there in a crowd of people, and and I'm telling you, I all at once knew this was much more than this man talking down there because something was talking to my heart I had never heard before. John Wesley, when he got saved after a lot of religion in his life, when he finally got saved, he said, my heart was strangely warm. Why would he say it strangely? Because he had never felt that before. And I never felt what I was feeling. I walked down that 
that thing when he gave it in. I didn't care. If he'd have said, you've got to come down here and take your clothes all off and sing the Star Spangled Banner, I'd have been the first one down there because I was like, this is something I need. And I got down there and some guy trained to tell me what to do and I'm sure he took me through the plan of salvation and I'm sure he shared the Romans Road or, or something and I'm sure he prayed a prayer that he wanted me to pray after him. I remember none of that. But what I do remember is saying, God, if this is real, if this really is true, what I'm feeling, I need you in my life. And I'm telling you, I know that I know that I know I encountered the living Lord Jesus Christ that night. Just a few weeks later, driving in my car, I was trying to pray. or I didn't really know what I was doing. I had no knowledge of the Bible. But I knew something had happened, and I'm trying to pray. And all at once, a glory cloud just came into my car. 69 Firebird, good little car that I had. And God just showed up in that car with me. And I, just, I remember driving and I was absolutely petrified to look over beside me because I thought, if I see it, I'm just going to die right here on the spot. But he was sitting in the car with me. I mean, those experiences were so real. You've got to have an encounter with Jesus. That's, that's the way this whole thing gets started. Listen, in Matthew 16, you see it so very clear about how you get in this thing. First of all, in that Matthew 16 passage, Jesus had come with his disciples to the region of Caesarea Philippi with its rocks and, and its beauty. And he said, you know, who do men say that I am? Well, some say you're Jeremiah, some because you weep. And others, you know, say you're John the Baptist. Well, who do you say that I am? And these men standing there recognized in that moment this is not just a good time we're having here we're in the presence of God in the flesh and Peter stood up and spoke it out thou art the Christ thou art the Messiah thou art the anointed one the son of the living God and Jesus said you got it and you know what you didn't get that by going to school. You didn't get that by having a history lesson. You didn't get that by memorizing even scripture. You didn't get that by going through a class. You didn't get that by being dunked in some water. You got that because my Father in heaven has revealed that into your heart. You don't get saved and have an encounter without the Holy Spirit revealing it in you. It becomes real that way. And then what did he do? He confessed with his mouth. That's what you do. When all this happens, you, let, you speak it out. You, you say I believe that Jesus is Lord. I make him Lord of my life. He is the Messiah. He is the anointed one. He is the Christ. And you do that publicly. You don't hide it. You don't just say it in your car by yourself. You say it out loud. Let everyone know Jesus is Lord of my life. But it all begins in that, that encounter with the Lord. Well, that encounter, I want you to know something, continues to produce transformation in our life. This is the secret. This is, it's not a secret. It's the key. It's, it's right there. Encountering Jesus, his presence, is what changes everything. Now, this is a strange passage. It's happened several times in the history of God's people when this messenger of God, this angel of the Lord, and, and you might notice in your English versions that the angel is capitalized, and there's a recognition that we're dealing something here more than just a, an angel like Gabriel. And we recognize that when we get into it and you say, wow, this is crazy because, you know, he said, I am, I'm wonderful. And, and you, you, know, you know who this is that went up in that. But how could he do it? He hasn't been born yet. The incarnation hasn't taken place yet. How does all that fit? And understand this is a, what we call a pre-incarnate uh, revelation of Jesus Christ. I don't know. Don't ask me. I got a few degrees behind my name. I learned a little Greek and Hebrew. I have no clue how to explain that. But it's there. And God's bigger than that. And that's when we get into this whole idea of understanding God as a trinity. And, boy, it's a scary thing to talk about the trinity. Because it's so very hard to conceive in our minds. We do not worship three gods. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God. He's one God. But we believe that that one God has manifested himself in three personalities, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Now, how, how can that be? You know, I had a theology professor when I was in school. He said, if I ever hear of one of you boys standing in a pulpit and giving an illustration of the Trinity, I will immediately come and yank your degree off the wall. Because you cannot give an illustration of the Trinity. It breaks down too quickly. You know, you've heard people say this. Well, the Trinity's like water. You know, it can be H2O liquid or it can be vapor you know, or it can be solid and ice and the same thing but different. No, because those aren't equal to one another. And so you can't do that, you know. People do that. I, I thought about something, and I'm going to say it real, I'm going to say that I can't say it, and then I'm going to say it anyway, and then tell you, I forget what I told you, you know, when I give you the illustration of it. 
But, but I thought about understanding the role of these because the Godhead in these personalities has different roles expressed. And, and I thought about this this way. If I, if I were to say this, last week in staff meeting, I made a decree in staff meeting. I said, when we come to church and assemble as the church in this building Sunday morning, I want the lights to be turned on. And you know what? I made that decree to do that. When this morning rolled around and we got here, I, I'm going to say Jordan walked in. I doubt he was the first one, but if he was the first one, he walked in. And Jordan actually went over there and flipped the switch and turned the lights on because I had decreed the lights to be on. I'm, I'm going somewhere with this. But let me know, once I decreed it to happen and Jordan turned the lights on, just because he flipped the switch don't mean we're going to have light. There's a generator somewhere out here, oil, coal, uh, wind, something generating electricity that was brought in that made it actually come on. So think about it a minute. The Father is the one that decrees things to take place. And it is the Son. God the Father said, let there be light. But the Bible says it was through Jesus, the Son of God, that all things were created. So what the Father decrees, Jesus fulfills but the power source that makes it all happen comes through the holy spirit he's the generator he's the force of heaven now forget that illustration and don't tell anybody i ever said that you know but somehow no that still don't work because that's not equal but it gives you an idea to think to think a little bit about it so why am i talking about this we need to understand the power of the person of the holy spirit today in encountering god I want you to understand something today. Do you you realize without the Holy Spirit today, you and I are no different at all from any other religion in the world? Because without the Holy Spirit, all we have is a message. And it's it's a good message, but there's other people that have good messages that have been handed down too. The difference with us is that we not only have a message, we have the living presence of God that accompanies our message. You know, then you, 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 you see the power of this. You know, I, I, I'm going to illustrate it this way. If, if I were to ask you today, if somehow or another you could go back to Israel, go back to the land in the first century, and you were there when Jesus was here on this earth, and you happened to be in the crowd when Jesus raised somebody from the dead, would that change your life? No, it wouldn't. wouldn't change your life at all. You say, wait a minute, yeah. No, it didn't change the lives of those who saw it. The same people that saw him do the miracles shouted, crucify him, crucify him, when it was convenient. They didn't get their life changed by that. Why? The Holy Spirit didn't give. Only the Holy Spirit generates a real life change because then it becomes real to us in our lives. You see, Jesus did a lot of mighty works, did he not? He walked on water. He raised people from the dead. He healed the sick. He he did mighty works. But what does the Bible say? Not by might or power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Might and power are stupendous, and they walked around amazed at what Jesus did. But they didn't get their life changed. It's only by the spirit that it becomes real to us and affects a real life change. That's why the Holy Spirit is so important to us. I, I was in Israel uh, when I was with our group a couple of years ago, and something I saw in Jerusalem made me think about something that I didn't quite know and how some different things happened right after Christ was raised from the dead. So I came back home, and I was studying and, and trying to put that in my mind, how some things fit, and I, and I kind of stumbled over something that kind of got me. Because you know what we did? We spent thousands of dollars, all of us did, to travel in a plane. We had a group just got back a couple week ago that went this year. And we, we travel, spend all that money over there. We go over there, we walk in the area where Jesus turned the water into wine. We go down to the Sea of Galilee, the actual, you know, lake area there where Jesus walked on the water and had the boat and went, taught his disciples and, and healed the people. Went to Capernaum to the synagogue right there where Jesus did all those miracles. Went to, went to Golgotha and saw the place where Jesus was crucified, the empty tomb. We, we went into all these places, and it was, it's a wonderful, great experience. But I went back and started saying, I said, you know, it's really funny. After the Romans took over and kicked all the Jews out in 70 A.D., there was a huge presence of believers that gathered around Caesarea by the sea. And for 150 years, it was a huge presence. That I, I don't know my distances exactly. It's, a, it's an hour away from Jerusalem, maybe. And we have no record at any time ever of those Christians saying, hey, let's go back up there to the place where, you know, Jesus ascended into heaven. Let's stand and worship there. 
let's go over to Bethlehem and go down in the cave and, and see the place where the Son of God was born. They, they could walk to it, and they never went. Why? Because he ain't there. He's in here. He's right where we meet. When two or three are gathered, he is in our midst. We don't need to go back up there. He's here. That's what makes Christianity different than anything else. I'm not preaching to you a history lesson today that you memorize and say, yeah, I believe this, this, and this. I'm talking to you. We can encounter the living God. I heard a good definition of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is Jesus without limits. He was limited in his body. He only been in one place at one time when he was here on this earth. The Holy Spirit is Jesus without limits. So you know what I've got to do? I've got to understand this. I've got to get to know the Holy Spirit. I've got to walk and understand how he reveals himself and what he does in my life. Now, I'm talking about how to have, because you say, how do I do this? I want to talk to you about having an encounter with Jesus just in a second here. I'm going to give you a couple of verses. This is, this is just so powerful. Follow this with me just for a moment. Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse 8. This is early as the law is being put into place and and what does it tell us happened there? It says, at that time, the Lord separated the tribe of Levi to bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord. Look at this. To stand before the Lord to minister to him and to bless in his name to this day. If I could read further, we would talk, see the awesome manifest power of God that fell as these group, this tribe that did not have a land allocation but are called with a task. You are to minister before me. You are to minister to me. Did you know as long as the Levites were ministering to God and the fire was on the altar that the nation had nothing to really worry about? But that's what they're calling. And I, I believe today God still, all of God's people are called to encounter him, all of God's people to worship. But there are a group of intercessors. There are a group of people in every gathering that, that, that f- have that unbelievable ability and need to press in. And, and they stand in the gap and they pray and they worship like, like these Levites did. But isn't that an interesting phrase there? To stand before the Lord to minister to him. I, I, I'm called into the ministry. That's the word we use. I'm called in more. What's the ministry? Ministry is all about serving people. You know, and people say, oh, if you don't love people, you know, Barry, you, you, you're never going to be able to be a good minister. You got to love people. You know, I, I always worried about that because I'm going to tell you what, I don't love everybody like I want to. Some people aren't very lovable. Sometimes I'm not very lovable. And I struggle with it sometimes. I say, well, Lord, am I even called? And then I saw what Jesus, you know, it's funny. People tell you stuff, and then you read the Bible. I was reading the Bible one day when God called Peter. And he asked Peter three times before he commissioned him. He said, do you love me? Do you love me? Lord, you know I love you. Do you love me? Lord, you know I love you. Jesus didn't say, do you love people? He said, do you love me? Number one, first and foremost, we better love God. And look what he says, minister to the Lord. All I've ever been taught my whole life is how to minister for the Lord. Nobody has ever taught me how to minister to to the Lord how do you minister to the Lord I think of ministry to you as that if you're hurting if you need help if you need counsel if you're in a difficult situation you need a prayer partner you need a dream mate I want to be there for you I want to be a good pastor to help you understand God's counsel and to understand what God is doing hopefully I can help you find that out in your life and, and minister to you but here they're called to minister to God God don't need any ministry what, what does this mean well maybe I'm defining ministry wrong What does that mean? Minister to him. We spend all our time ministering for the Lord. And we don't know what it means to minister to the Lord. Back when I first started out in ministry, being the rational thinker that I am on steroids, when I would have a message or have an opportunity to preach, I'd always say yes. And then I'd go through this unbelievable struggle before I preached. The very first date Amy and I had uh, was 30 minutes after I got off the payroll of being her youth pastor and picked her up for our first date because I wouldn't date any of the youth, but I wasn't on the 
tell you, I wasn't the youth pastor anymore. So we, and honestly, 30 minutes after I got off, I picked her up for our first date. And I was preaching at a huge youth gathering of a luau. And I got, I'm telling you, I don't, why in the world this woman stuck with me? I have no idea. Because I mean, I was going nuts. Because I thought, what am I supposed to say? How am I going to say it? I don't know. And then I get there and my pastor's there. I didn't know he was going to be there. I thought, he's never heard me speak. I'm going to fall all over myself. I don't know that I got this together right. I'm so, whoa, 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 whoa. And I got up and, you know, God bless. And it was okay. And guess what? Two weeks later, I get invited to do something else. Yeah, I'll do it. Oh, God, what do I do? How do I get this together? I just did that over and over all the time. I was on staff of a church. The associate pastor years later. I already pastored two churches. And I'm on staff of this church, and one, I was preaching on Sunday morning. The pastor was out of town, and I couldn't get the message together, and I was struggling with it. And I called this faithful prayer warrior in the church. I said, pray for me tonight. I am dying here. i got to preach in the morning, and the message is not coming together like I want it. And he said, Barry, 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 God has no trouble with the message. It's just the messenger he has to prepare. You're going to be fine. That didn't help me. I want a sermon. Give me three points in a poem. I need something to say tomorrow. And you get up and you preach. I've been doing this for years, folks. I love to preach. I, this is what God called me to do. I love taking his word and doing that, but I hate it sometimes. My wife says, I have a love-hate affair with preaching because I love it and I hate it. I want it to be a home run every time I stand up. I want to preach the greatest sermon since Pentecost every time I stand up. And listen, you can't do that if you preach every week. One of my good friends, Gerald knows, he's out of the ministry in, in business now, and, but he used to be a pastor, but he still preaches some. He preaches a couple times. He called me the other day. He said, ah, I'm preaching this Sunday at so-and-so's church. He said, you want to hear my next greatest sermon? I said, Greg, anybody can have a great sermon when you only preach three times a year. You know, preach about 55 or 60 times a year, and then come talk to me, you know. I said, you know, I never like, here's what I'm trying to go with all this. I'm trying to say this. You get to the point where you say, it's not about me. And getting all tied up in myself. You know, most of that's just pride. I'm worried I'm going to get up here and fall on my face. I mean, I've been doing this all. I still worry. I get butterflies. I think, oh, man, is that going to come out? Is this going to sound right? Did I do that? I, 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 I go home every Sunday afternoon and have a, you know, a vulnerability hangover because I'm thinking, what did I say? Did I say that? The other day I said, I was sitting there. We were watching the ball game. And I looked at Amy and said, did I say something about a baby bump in TMZ today? She goes, yep, you did. I went, oh, man, what was that about, you know? I mean, you know, and so I, I, I know it, but you get tied up in yourself. I heard Benny Hinn speak the other day about doing Catherine Coleman's uh, memorial service. He was 24 years old, and they asked him to do this big memorial service and, and said the lady that was in charge came to him and said, now, 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 Benny, don't you go pray and get all tied up in yourself. Go take a nap. He said, that's the most unspiritual woman I've ever heard in my life. Oh, no, go take a nap. Go take a nap. Get over yourself. And so, I'm telling you this as a preacher, but what about you? You know, what is it to me to say, I'm going to quit learning to minister for him, and I'm going to start ministering to him. I have the ability to do something no one else can do as you do. And that is, as a created human being, now redeemed and regenerated by the Holy Spirit of God, with God taking up, I have the ability to say to God, I love you. No angel can tell God, if, they can if they're commanded to, but it's not understood. I never looked at this verse this way, but in Ephesians, when it says to the intent that the wisdom of the church will be made known to the manifold principalities of power, you know, the angels learn to worship and learn to do what they do in the amazement of observing us. Boy, that's crazy. They look at us and see what we go through and then how we praise him. And, and then they know his character and work so they can say holy, holy, holy. But they have no capacity to be in the relationship with him like we are. As a child of God, I have the ability to know God as Abba Father. And to walk with him and experience and minister. Let me, get, let me give you another one real quick. 1 Samuel chapter 3. I love this passage. What it says, now the boy Samuel, this is verse 1, verse 7, 3. Now the boy Samuel ministered, hi, here it is, to the Lord. Can you believe this? The whole nation's in a mess, and one little boy is going to save the whole nation. He ministered before uh, the Lord before Eli, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no widespread revelation. It, it was bad. It gets worse. Verse 2, and it came to pass at the time while Eli, he was the high priest, was lying down in this place, and when his eyes had begun to grow dim, so he could not see. That's what happens when you have no revelation. You can't see. You know, we're going to see how important Samson's eyes are before we get through this series. His eyes are incredibly important. 
And we're going to understand the importance of seeing before we get through. But here you got a place, the, the fire's going out. Let me read the rest of it there. Verse 3, and before the lamp of God went out in the tabernacle of the Lord, where the ark of God was and while Samuel was lying down, you got the lamp going out. you got the preacher that can't see. It's a dark, no revelation. And in the middle of it, a little boy ministered to the Lord. And that boy has a great background and a great future. Ministered to the Lord. What, what is this minister to the Lord, this power failure. What, what is this? I don't know how to do this because I don't know how to tell you what ministering to the Lord is. But I'm going to make a feeble attempt at showing you how to minister to the Lord. Just bear with me for a minute here. Frank, will you help me bring a chair up here for me? I'm going to try to do something here and just show you because sometimes we can just see it and say, what does it mean? I've got my, my, my phone's not working so it might not work right. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that. I'm going I'm to turn it this way because I don't want to be facing it. I'm just going to kind of let you enter into my little room at home. And I, got, I just, I don't, I love music. And I got, a, I got a playlist right here that's just one of about six I have that are in the, this particular playlist is 33 songs, two hours and 54 minutes long. And uh, I'm not going to play it that long. But let me, let me just show you. I'm trying to look for one here that I wanted to. Wanted to see if I can find it uh, here. Here it is right here. I don't know how this will work, but just let's just, you know, this is the way I minister to the Lord. You hear this? I like these old songs. Not a lot of I's and us's and we's in it. It's not about the Lord. Every time. 
fall, God. Let your glory fall, God. We're thirsty, God. Let your glory fall right here, right now. Oh, thank you, Lord. Let your glory fall. Lord, I stand in the midst of a multitude of those from every tribe and might be the best message right there you've ever heard in your whole life you know what I wanted to do I played about 30 seconds of that and I said I need to get up I need to explain this I need to do that quit talking just sit before the Lord and just worship him I wanted I wanted to oh I gotta get up and explain this I gotta no I'll just sit there you said well you didn't do anything so what is it yeah I just sat before the Lord just started getting in some worship songs there and a lot of times when I do that, I just want to get out on my face and just lay out. I didn't want to do that here. It's hard to get up and down. But I just lay out before the Lord and do that. Whatever. You say, well, what, what are you doing? Just spending time with Jesus. No agenda. No, I got to do this. I got to do that. You know, that's hard for us to do, isn't it? In this digital culture, we've been trained to go 30 seconds here, 30 seconds here. When's the last time you spent... Ten minutes, ten minutes doing nothing, just saying, Lord, I just want to sing a song to you. You know, I, I don't listen like I just did. I, I've got it where I can put it directly in my ears through Bluetooth and so nobody else can hear what I'm hearing. And I get to singing. I can't sing, but I get to singing. And my dog. Eli the dog, every time I realize I've been doing it, he comes over and just lays his head in my lap. He thinks I'm singing to him every time I sing. I realize, oh, I've been singing. The dog's over here laying in my lap. And I just think about that. You know, just sing. You know, all this stuff. It don't matter. Just minister to the Lord. Just spend time with him and worship him. Can I just fully admit to you as pastor today, I haven't done enough of that. I haven't done enough of that. I gotta get the sermon together. I gotta get this together. I gotta get that. Just, you know, just yesterday I went in my study yesterday and I thought, you know, I got all this stuff on Samson I'm so excited about, but I didn't have the first message done. I said, tomorrow's Sunday. I gotta finish this. I gotta pull it together. And I'm in there trying to pull it all together and I started listening to some stuff. And next thing you know, I've spent four hours just sitting in my chair. And doing no study, not looking up a Greek word or a Hebrew word, not reading history, not doing just sitting there and just worshiping God. Thinking about how good he's been to me and just worship, just talking to the Lord. You know, it was about two hours into that, the anointing of God fell in that room. It don't always happen where you feel something really strong, but it did yesterday. And I just sat in there. And I'm t- I've never in my life felt it as strong as I felt it just sitting there the other day. And just ministering to the Lord. I'm going to tell you, you want the secret to everything. And the thing the enemy doesn't want you to learn, how to have an encounter with God. Oh, I pray the church. Lord, let our worship music, let our sermons, let our plans and our programs and our slick brochures and all of that stuff. Lord, don't let ever let any of that get in the way of us just being your people and you being our God. Hmm. Samson had everything. And Israel was going to be changed forever. This man was going to become an example for centuries to this day. All because the angel of the Lord appeared to his mom and dad. Changed their life forever. 
one encounter with God, you'll never be the same. You'll never be the same. And another encounter will make you not the same again. And another encounter. I hunger for the presence of God to be manifested and felt among his people, to transform us in a way it's not about us and it's not about what we do. It's about him.